Hi everyone. In this video, we're going to be uh, talking about the programming language R, a little bit of high level aspects about the programming language itself um, and comparing and contrasting it with common alternatives. So the R programming language uh, is very similar to Python, um, has somewhat uh, similar characteristics to Java and C, other programming languages, um, most similar to Python in my opinion, uh, but uh, there's pros and cons to these various different languages. Uh, they all sort of have their specialty areas, R very much being into statistics, although uh, more recently has sort of broadened the scope of uh, the programming language in general. Um, R is what we'd call an interpreted language, meaning that commands are processed uh, line by line in R. Um, so if you're familiar with some other programming languages um, like SAS uh, or Java, typically you submit or compile uh, maybe your whole script or blocks of code at once. Uh, but R can literally be run line by line um, and so this allows for a bit more interactivity for you as the user while you're using it. Okay. Uh, this is not uh, free though, this interactivity. It comes at a cost uh, by being able to use the code in this way. It's typically a bit slower uh, for most operations that you would equivalently implement in something like uh, C, for example, the programming language C. Um, so that's one of the main critiques of R is that it can be slow for doing things at times. Um, but if you're not working with very large data sets, uh, you don't need like uh, linear algebra operations on large matrices many, many times, things like that. Uh, the speed might be, the difference in speed might be negligible most of the time, in which case R is always a great option for, for many different areas of uh, statistics or analysis. And in my biased opinion, <laughs> R is much easier to use, program in, um, and has been much more flushed out in terms of its capability for data analysis and statistics, uh, predictive modeling than other programming languages. But that's not to say R is the best always for everything. Uh, so Python, in, in my opinion, has a very strong case um, in that it covers, you, you can do a lot of similar things in R and Python. Okay? Uh, so especially deep learning uh, is, is very well implemented in Python. Uh, in my experience, Python's the best programming language if you really need to use deep learning. Natural language processing uh, in which you take uh, text data. Uh, so for example, uh, if you wanna look at all of the tweets that contain a certain hashtag and want to generate insights from all of those tweets, uh, that's, that process of analysis is called uh, natural language processing. Python has some wonderful tools, tools for that. Image classification models. Uh, so you might be familiar with like uh, the Google Lens app or other other types of software that can take a picture or an image as an input and provide an output for what it thinks that image most likely contains. Like you can give it a picture of a dog and it'll identify that that's a dog. Uh, so those image classification models, there's some very nice ones implemented in Python as well. Uh, web scraping, uh, so this involves writing a program that can fetch or grab data off of websites, return it to you uh, on your computer. There's some wonderful options in, in Python for web scraping as well. That's not to say that R cannot do these things. Okay, so um, deep learning models can be fit in R. Uh, natural language processing models, definitely that's within the past just few years, I would say. Uh, R's capabilities for natural language processing has greatly improved. 
uh, image classification models. I think I've seen it in R, but it, it's somewhat limited. I would say Python's still definitely the edge there. Um, and web scraping has been flushed out and developed some in R as well. So sort of Python and R can very, very similar in their capabilities. Um, Python's probably a bit more widely used, um, especially in the computer science community, but R has gained a lot of popularity as well, uh, especially in among statisticians, R is, R is very, very popular. And both SAS, uh, I'm sorry, both Python and R are free. They don't cost anything. Uh, so they're great options in that way. Contrasting that to SAS, which costs quite a bit of money uh, to be able to use this software. So SAS uh, is a programming language for those not familiar. Uh, that has a lot of statistical, great statistical methods implemented in it um, and is user-friendly in that you don't need to be an expert statistician. You don't need to have a PhD in statistics to be able to fit some uh, pretty complicated models in SAS. It sort of guides the user quite a bit along the way. That being said, again, the cost is is a big burden for SaaS users, I would say, um, and a large reason, uh, in my opinion, that a lot of companies are transitioning or moving away from SaaS simply because it just costs so much money when there's alternatives like R and Python that are freely available. Another pro of using SaaS, though, is that it has good stability of code so SAS has been around since the 1960s, I believe. Um, and they tried to keep the code very stable in that old code, uh, even code that's decades old in SAS, uh, could still compile uh, potentially. Whereas for R, if your R code is 10 years old, it's very likely it won't compile because stuff has changed in R uh, so much over that time. Some other alternatives, if you're needing to do a lot of linear algebra operations uh, with very large matrices or um, needing to calculate inverses of large matrices many, many times, R can be a bit slow with those types of operations. Um, so C++, for example, would be a programming language that's very fast with its linear algebra. Um, however, People have recognized this in the R community and created tools to sort of work around this um, by, say, writing R packages that implement C++ code underneath while still just being able to code in R the entire time. Uh, so why R? Why not all these other languages? <laughs> well, this professor at Baylor University uh, was comparing, wanted to compare and contrast the Stata programming language, which is popular in the economics community, uh, to R. So he paid this couple via Cameo um, to, to do a, a, a funny video comparing and contrasting them. So I won't play it in this video, but if you want to watch it, feel free to, to click on this link in the slides to watch that video. Okay, so talking a bit about R uh, some more. So R comes, uh, when, you, when you install R and R Studio, it comes with what we would say the bare minimum code to sort of get you up and running. This is still quite a bit, uh, but it doesn't come with a lot of complex specialty functions uh, or code that you might find in say SAS right out of the box. Okay, SAS comes bundled with a whole bunch of different procedures, routines, um, and you don't really add new stuff onto SAS as you need it. You sort of just use SAS as it is, and it has so much to begin with. That works fine. R uses what are called packages, collections of R code that other people have written uh, that you can install to sort of add on functionality uh, or methods that you can implement in R based on code other people have written. So maybe I need a very special type of um, 
again, natural language processing model that's that's novel. Maybe somebody proposed this new modeling framework just a year ago, and they wrote an R package to implement it. So I could download their package and be able to use and fit their new model that they just came out with okay, by, by retrieving that package. So R is very adaptable and uh, can quickly keep up to speed with new and improving methods. Um, so that's part of what helps it in growing in popularity as well. Okay. Most R packages that you will download are available from CRAN, the Comprehensive R Network, uh, which is an organization which somewhat evaluates and vets these R packages. Uh, so I want to emphasize like SAS code, if you implement a, a SAS function, uh, if you use SAS code to say fit a generalized linear model, the SAS developers work on making that code efficient and that it correctly implements that type of model based on statistical theory, right? CRAN, when they evaluate someone's package and decide to post it and make it available, they don't check to see if your package is implemented correctly or not. Uh, they sort of see, does it run OK on an operating system? Um, does it not have like obvious malware embedded in it? They sort of do like bare minimum checks like this, um, but they don't say if you claim that your package has a function to calculate a matrix inverse really fast, they don't check your code and see if it's actually calculating a matrix inverse. They'll still put it up even if, you know, if, if the calculation is off, okay? Uh, but that's not to say that you can't trust R functions. Uh, many, many users, many tens of thousands of users or hundreds of thousands, you know, use these most popular R packages. And so there's sort of a lot of informal checking or vetting of these procedures. Um, and I think if, if there were a misleading function, uh, there would be a lot of people pointing it out and it would be fixed pretty quickly. Okay, so for the most part, you can trust that the R package is doing what it says. Uh, although newer packages, especially, maybe if they're brand new, there might be a little bit more um, potential issues with that. And you do have to get through some administrative hurdles, some requirements to have a package published on CRAN. Sometimes people don't even want to go through uh, those administrative hurdles because they can take months. Uh, and sometimes CRAN can be very picky about rejecting packages for trivial reasons. Okay. Um, and so some people publish their packages uh, via web a website called GitHub. Uh, so GitHub does no checks whatsoever uh, and you can make your packages available. To, to the entire world. Uh, so when I was in grad school at Minnesota, uh, I published three R packages uh, via GitHub uh, because I didn't wanna go through the administrative hurdles at CRAN. And this wasn't a problem for me because anyone wanting to use my package likely is comfortable enough with uh, downloading my package off GitHub. Wouldn't be a problem for them. So as you're using R, there's sort of three main areas you'll be looking for help when needed. Um, web searching using Google uh, is of course a great resource. So uh, it's not the only way though, there are built-in help functions in R. Uh, so we'll look at some of using that some this semester a bit, uh, but typically for new programmers, especially, the help files can be a bit verbose or dense in their language. Uh, so it's not the most useful unless you're, say, a computer developer yourself, a developer. It, it, the way they wrote it can be a bit complicated. Um, 
web search, I would say, will be the most common way in which you'll be seeking out help for using R. How do I do X in R? Just Googling that, usually a great way to find results. Um, Stack Overflow is a website that commonly has a lot of uh, a lot of people asking questions about things like R. And then, so typically it'll be someone asks a question and this, this, this post would show up in like a Google search. Someone asks a question, how do I do this? And then people give answers. And you wanna look for this green check here. It's sort of like the verified answer among the many given. Um, so they typically give like a written response and then the code that you were looking for sometimes as well. That's not to say that the other responses that people gave are, are incorrect. Uh, it's just sort of this one got the most votes uh, and got verified through some process on Stack Overflow. But sometimes there's very useful answers in the, in the other responses as well. Okay. So Stack Overflow that you'll find via Googling something uh, can be very helpful. Uh, and just a quick note, R develops and changes so rapidly that sometimes even the Stack Exchange, uh, the Stack Overflow posts can be dated in that the code that someone gave that worked and was like a green check solution at some point can be outdated uh, to where it might cause an error sometimes in R. Although I found this to be quite rare. Uh, it has happened, but usually R is stable enough that stuff even works many years later. I mentioned the built-in help functions in R and how those can be a bit verbose. Uh, so we won't we won't look at that today, uh, but later in the semester, once we get a bit more acquainted with R, we'll look at using the help documentation for various functions. Okay. Aside from Googling, uh, coming to office hours, asking questions, online books are a great resource uh, for learning R, especially I would say if you are trying to learn about a specific area that you have in mind, uh, say, uh, time series analysis. If your boss gave you some time series data and you needed to analyze it in R but don't really know where to start, there's likely a very good online book for free if you just Google around that's all about time series analysis in R. And that goes for many different areas of analysis. So mentioned this before, uh, in this class, we're going to be using RStudio in order to program in R, uh, which is called, RStudio is called an IDE, Integrated Development Environment. Um, it's essentially the graphical user interface, uh, the way in which we'll be programming in R. Now, as you get going programming in R, at first, especially if this is your first programming language that you're using and you're sort of just getting your feet wet, you probably don't need to worry about naming and formatting too much. You'll just be writing code to get your solution and get it done. But as you get more comfortable with programming, and if you're sort of quite comfortable right off the bat, jumping right into R, it's good to consider using consistent naming and formatting conventions to sort of make your code easier to read for yourself or someone else further down the road. So Dr. Allison Horst at the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, made this great graphic uh, that shows different naming conventions you could use for your code. Uh, so when you create an R object or variable, you get to name it, uh, excluding uh, certain special characters. You can't have spaces in it, um, but you can have underscores, dashes. R allows periods or decimals in the variable names as well. Uh, and R is case sensitive with its variable names. Uh, so this camel case is different than if you had the first C capitalized. R would consider those different objects or different variables. Uh, so that's something we have to be careful of 
because uh, not all programming languages are that way. Uh, SAS, for example, for the most part is case agnostic. So it, it treats variables the same, whether they're all caps or all lowercase, it use them as the same if it's the same letters. Uh, another thing, to consider once you're more comfortable programming in R uh, is using consistent style in your coding. Uh, so there's this Google style guide that I linked to here, sort of just to provide it as a resource. Uh, this was a developer team at Google uh, who, or a data science team who was coding in R. Uh, so they had multiple people on their team programming in R and to facilitate sharing of code between all the members of the team. They wanted to some, somewhat standardize how people were coding. So for example, naming variables in a consistent way, uh, among other, other things like how to write comments in a consistent way. Uh, so these are just guidelines and what this team did is very useful, but you don't have to follow it. And this is, again, sort of once you get more familiar with coding in R, these might be good things to consider. There's also auto formatting options in our studio uh, that can help you automatically format your code. Uh, again, yes, yeah, similar light with this in that once you get more comfortable, Structuring your code in a consistent way will help your future self and others who read your code uh, down the road. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I don't want these to be intimidating for you. So even just adopting some of these habits uh, would be helpful uh, for you for you as you code in R here. So one example of how we can structure an R code uh, and R script is to start with a comment at the top of our R script about what the R code does, load packages with the library function, the library command. Uh, sometimes you need to source or load other R scripts into yours. Um, that's good to do at that part. And then defining constants like file paths, uh, maybe there's some numeric constant that's important at the top of your script. And then sort of getting into the defining of functions, importing data, uh, and going through with the rest of your analysis. Okay. So here's an example of how an R script could look. This code, where we start with the comment at the top, load a package like the tidyverse, uh, define constants like this file path, import data and go on with analyzing the data. Okay. This is just one example though. Uh, and again, people all program slightly different. Uh, so you can structure it however you would like. This is just one example of how that could work. Okay. Organizing code files. So another way that you can uh, save yourself work is to use what are called RStudio projects. Uh, so I'll briefly demonstrate that here right now. Uh, so when you open up our studio, okay, you can open up a new project by clicking this button here, this plus sign that's in right on this R that's like inside an ice cube or something it looks like. That allows you to create a new project. Um, which can be based on an existing folder or directory on your computer, or you can create a new folder or directory in your computer that contains this project. Okay. Our projects to me are very similar to folders um, in that they just contain multiple R scripts or files. So like here's one R script. You might have two programs you're working with or three or four starts to get to be a lot. And Art Studio projects are a great way to organize based on different areas that you're working on. Uh, so for example, I have in our project that's for this class, 
STAT 418, 518. I have a different R project to organize my R scripts for STAT 216 um, that has several R scripts in there. Uh, one for my fantasy football league uh, that has its own set of R scripts in there. And so I can just switch between these in order to open up sort of a fresh R Studio environment that has the scripts open that are relevant to that project. So it's an easy way to sort of close and open many files at once that are relevant for a specific area that you're interested in. It's not a must do. I didn't adopt this um, using R Studio projects until I'd already been using R for a couple years, but it can be quite helpful. Again, once you get your feet wet, a bit more comfortable with R. Debugging is inevitably something we will be doing uh, a lot. That's a large part of programming, is you have bugs, errors that occur, and trying to fix those as you go along. Okay. So as I mentioned before, using Google, uh, that's going to be our friend this semester as we try to debug uh, and figure out errors that pop up in our R code. Another small piece of advice uh, is to test your R code as you go. Uh, and again, once you get more experienced in R, uh, this is talking about once you're capable uh, or comfortable with writing several lines of code at once, it can be tempting uh, to keep writing R code, filling up your script, and then to try and run it at the end once you have a whole bunch of code written, uh, rather than writing a line or two, running it, making sure it works before you move on. And that's usually the better practice uh, to run a little bit of code at a time, just because you catch errors uh, or mistakes in your code earlier uh, before you sort of have that error or mistake cascade into ruining uh, later parts of your code. And sometimes you're sitting there trying to fix your code over and over again, and stuff just keeps getting worse. So unfortunately, you just have to start over. Um, and I would say this is this always feels a bit defeating, uh, but I feel like I found sometimes just completely giving up on a piece of code and then just writing it from scratch in a blank new sheet new editor ends up much faster than trying to sit there and debug the current issue I've got going on. Okay. So yeah, writing more code rather than trying to fix your code sometimes can be helpful. Um, but it all depends on, you know, what the circumstances of your particular program, of course, and, and you'll develop your own sort of coding style as you go. So, Today, we're going to look at uh, an activity, or ac this after this video, you'll look at an activity. Uh, and then we also uh, still have the same reading that we should do this week uh, after, after the activity.